Um, it's great to be actually in a room with people. Um, that hasn't happened a lot, but like the rest of the working world, this is a hybrid event. So I also want to say hi to all the people on the live stream. And that's actually really emblematic, like the video was talking about, of the world we're sort of in right now. Sometimes we're online, sometimes we're in person. We know that we're going to something hybrid-y, but we don't really know what it looks like. I'm still trying to figure it out just for my own life, let alone the companies I write about. And as I try and figure it out, there's no one I would rather have this conversation with than our next guest, who is Stuart Butterfield, the CEO of Slack. Welcome, Stuart. Hey. Great to see you. Yeah. So I think I haven't seen you in person in quite a while. Like I feel like in the beginning of the pandemic, you were doing these video series, you know, talking to journalists, what we were doing. We kind of figured out the whole pandemic thing. We've been talking about this idea, oh, it's not going to be the same. You know, the, it's all changed. We're going to go back. It's going to be different. It's going to be hybrid. And we use these words, but I don't know if I'm the only one. I imagine there's others in the audience. I don't actually know what that really looks like. Like, I get that some people will be in the office, and some people will be online, and some people will be only one or the other, and some people will be doing a little of both. But beyond that, do we really know what that looks like, or do we just kind of know that some people will be online and some people will be in person? You and me definitely don't know. Maybe, maybe someone does, but um, I think the, the interesting thing is it's, it's hard for you to imagine someone really wanting to go into the... Um, the office if they're the only one there. You know, if there aren't the colleagues and there aren't the amenities and there isn't the, the whole experience, which kind of suggests this bifurcation where um, we'll see if companies are successful in getting people to come back to the office, but obviously there's a lot of that going on now. Um, companies will definitely be successful with people not coming into the office because we just proved that, that you could do that. But the, the reason I think we don't really know is um, it's just too hard to pull apart all of these factors. Uh, where you are in your life makes a big difference. A lot of people who are fresh out of college uh, have a much higher desire to get back into the office as you know, the basis of their social life. Um, on the other hand, there's people like me who I have an 11 and a half month old, um, and there's no like trying to get the last train to get home before he goes to sleep or anything like that. And in fact, between calls, I can go downstairs and, and play with him. And three years ago, that's not at all what it would have been like, and, and uh, I just can't imagine giving that up. So there's a range of personal experiences, and then there's a, like, a range of what the, what the companies are, are aiming for. The, the distributed model, I think, has a, a little bit of an upper hand, just because um, it does seem to be the preference of most people. Like the, after comp, the number one desire people have is flexibility. And flexibility is a good thing, I think most people agree but it's also really complicated. It's really complicated to create a productive workforce in a, a, a world where we don't have set hours and set places. And it's also really difficult, and I want to get into this in a little bit, to create the workplace you want, the culture mm. you want. All those things become different and challenging. I'm curious, how close do you think you are at Slack to having the culture you want, even with a workforce that you don't See, I remember we were talking, you know, six, nine months into the pandemic, mm -hmm. and I think you had had the first acquisition, maybe. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about hiring an executive. You know, now every company has hired tons of people during the pandemic, but at the time it was new. Like, not that you can ma wave a magic wand, but if you could, what would, what would the ideal Slack work experience look like? What would some of the actual characteristics be beyond hybrid? Um. Well, the first thing my, my mind went to was, I'm not sure if this counts as, as hybrid or not, but the, um, the design of the offices. So we still have our, we, we let go of a couple of leases that were expiring. And I think we probably have like five or six offices. We were also, as pe many people probably know, acquired by Salesforce, so there's places where we- Oh, we're gonna get into that, okay. believe me. Um, but our headquarters is in San Francisco. I, I think it holds about like 1,250 people. It's 10 floors, you know, it's a glass, 10 stories isn't much of a tower, but you know, last office building anyway. Big logo on the side, and it's awesome. The, each floor is a different biome of the Pacific Crest Trail, and like we, we um, kind of threaded the needle between a cheap build out and something that people really love. And I went there 
one time so far during the pandemic, and there was 30 people in a space that's designed to hold 1,200, so it's very depressing um, and weird to be inside of it. But I think, I bet we had this exact, and I probably use the exact same phrase nine months in, the least important um, thing that we were paying for with that building was the factory farm, like battery chicken housing for people to sit at their desk and use their laptop by themselves and not talk to each other. All of the other stuff, like the projection of power and the place to bring recruits and the place to host uh, customers and the all hands and the meals and the offsites and the management training and learning development programs, all of that stuff was, was really valuable. So um, the, the, I guess the thing I'm looking forward to the most is uh, the results of a bunch of experiments you're doing in different kinds of layouts and different kinds of facilities. And this might sound icky to people, but uh, I was in Javits Center two months ago, and I was walking around, and it's like, man, we've got to build something like this. And I don't mean exactly like Javits Center, but the, you know, like those walls that you can move like they have in hotel ballrooms, and the catering facilities, and like the hundreds of desks or tables and chairs that you can kind of reconfigure. I think larger companies are going to need a, something like that in order to make the best use of people's time when they are physically together, because I think most of the time, people will be traveling. And you went through also a lot of, we all have gone through pandemic experiences. <laughs> Clearly, you've had a baby during the pandemic. You also had a corporate marriage during the <laughs> pandemic. What has it been like to become part of this much larger company during a pandemic? And what have you learned from it in terms of what a merger looks like post whatever we used to have before? Yeah, it's funny, because I think at this point, um, you mentioned hired someone to the exact team I don't actually know the latest number, but I would, if I had to guess, I'd say two thirds of our employees are probably hired post pandemic just because we've grown so much. Um, we did an $800 million convertible bond offering in the early days of the pandemic without having to go meet the investors. And this whole acquisition happened with no um, meeting in, in person at all. But now it just seems normal. It doesn't seem like, a, you know, back then doing the bond offering felt like at this crazy accomplishment and we were so happy we didn't have to travel. To I remember you were like, this is like perfect because <laughs> normally I'd have had to go and do that awful road show and yeah. Exactly. Um, but now it just seems like, at least to me, that seems like the normal. Like that's the, that's the default because why would you um, travel more than necessary? But like I said at the beginning, it's hard to pull these things apart. I, I came here from New York, so I took the train this morning and I wore a mask for three hours and that still sucks. You know, it's not, it's uncomfortable. Um, it's still a little bit scary, maybe overstates it, but you know, it's like you, there's a little bit of risk associated with that. Um, and that has nothing to do with, with whether people 10 years from now or 20 years from now will spend more time working in offices or more time working from home. But um, the other uh, factor that I think you need to tease out is we, if we were all, all gonna work from home, we wouldn't have built our houses or designed our houses the way that we, we designed them. And I think as people make more and more changes and more adjustments, um, it's, it's almost like a one-way ratchet to making it more pleasant, more comfortable to work from home than from the office. So that's really interesting. I mean, we talk a lot about how the office is gonna be different because of remote work. This is actually the first time I've had a conversation. How is the home gonna yeah. be different because of remote work? Are but, companies gonna start paying? I mean, they've reimbursed like a, you know, a computer here and there, maybe home internet, but we haven't had companies say, here's a bunch of money, build like a really productive workspace. Is that something you think we'll start to see? Yeah, I think some of that, and it's funny, I should see what happened to this, the startup that I remember uh, started like just before the pandemic and their business plan was like um, at home IT for remote workers. So we'll take care of like shipping the laptop, picking it up, the ergonomic chair, monitors, make sure people's networks are okay and, and stuff like that. And then the pandemic started like right after, I thought, that was a, that was a good business idea. Yeah, good, good timing. Um, but you know, that hasn't really come to fruition. And over the last couple of years, I have cursed the fact that there is no one from our business technology group who lives in my house and can help me with different things that, you know, as, they, as they arise. Um, again, post-pandemic, I think that's, that's less of a problem. And that does seem like something that's, that's ripe for outsourcing. But I think also just the reconfiguration of the, of the home. You know, like the, the kind of canonical set of rooms that people imagine gets shifted slightly because the people who, besides the young people, the people who came into the office during the pandemic were people who, two parents working at home, there just wasn't enough places to, to do calls at the same time. 
And I want to get into that because, you know, it's really one of the things that I think a lot about, and I've had some really interesting conversations. By the way, Reshma Sajani, who founded Girls Who Code, has a great new book out, Pay Up, looking at some of the equity issues. And one of the things we were talking about is you would think, like at first blush, when you think about the hybrid workforce, you think more flexibility, oh, that's going to be great for working moms. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's a real fear that it could be worse in the sense that if people have the option to be in the office or not, how much pro proximity bias will there be where those who are coming into the office um, seem like the people who are really committed and you give them the plum assignment because they're mm -hmm. right there. Um, how big of an issue is equity in the hybrid workforce? And have you given some thought to how do we make sure um, that we're really being inclusive? You know, inclusive used to just mean, you know, do we have like the camera turned on in the conference room so that whoever is remote is dialing in? But it's mm -hmm. really a lot more complicated than that. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's much more complicated, and there's a bunch of I me. Mean, so some of them are, are uh, I don't know, easy. I'm not sure. The the Salesforce exec team is is um, sometimes getting together in person, or at least parts of it. And it took one meeting before we made that rule, which is now pretty common, where. Even if you're in the same room, everyone joins the Zoom independently, so they have their own little square, because otherwise it's too hard to see. And um, there's there's that kind of stuff. And then there's the research that um, Future Forum, this is an organization that we we back, um, has done. Uh, all people who uh, work to companies where when they went to work they felt underrepresented are happier because there's like this. Right. You know, code shifting doesn't kind of ha have to happen. There's a flip side to some of those too. Like now you're seeing into my home, you know, like and you hear my kids and see what I have on my wall, and and, and that's like a little bit more intimate almost. Um, but the you know fewer microaggressions and and fewer um, I guess moments where you don't feel included, and uh, and that's obviously a positive thing. Right, and that's like there are these things that we sort of have learned actually work better that we clearly want to take with us. I think what's so tricky is figuring out what do we want to take with, what do we want to leave behind from both our experience zooming in. I mean, I totally get why you want each person that's physically present to be in their own Zoom window, but it also seems like we're kind of that doesn't that feel a little bit least common denominator like. If the future of office is us all sitting in our Zoom windows, that mm -hmm. sounds pretty crappy. Well, they still get to be in the same room with each other. Um, I, as the CEO, I, I'm not sure if this is the default or not, but I traveled more than the rest of my team, and so I was usually the one who was remote, and I just like, I'm getting old. It's so hard to hear, and it like, makes me cranky when I can't hear. Like the, um, we tried 20 different kinds of microphones and, and stuff like that, so I think that will be a boon no, no matter what, like the, the better configuration. Um, but I think the, the much more, well, I'm going to try something. I can't really see people in the audience that well, but I wouldn't mind a little hands up for people um, who would prefer to have the option to work from home in the future. It seems like a no-brainer. Like, it's got to yeah. be close to 100%, because who wouldn't want to have the, the option? Um, and I think as long as that, that desire is there, there's going to be more and more conventions um, that end up replacing the time that we spent in the office. Again, not using our laptops by ourselves and not talking to each other, but like actually building relationships and like uh, uh, strengthening trust and uh, I don't mean trust trust falls and, and stuff like that necessarily. Oh, we're doing but, that after, okay. by the way. <laughs> um, but it is really valuable to spend time with people face to face and I think people really crave that. And I think that is um, something that, that we've been really lacking over this period. You Going back to the beginning, I'm not sure how much of an impact that's had on the culture just because again, it's there's so many things that are different now that it's, it's hard to make the kind of direct comparison. But it is the thing that I think people uh, crave the most. And where do the technology tools fit in? I mean, obviously, pre-pandemic, you know, a lot of small companies, mid-size, even some large enterprises, had a strong Slack culture. I imagine that's boomed. Bigger companies are using it. It's become a real important part. Can you offer some, tan uh, some tangible ways that a tool like Slack needs to change now. Like, it, obviously, you added a bunch of audio and huddles and mm -hmm. stuff that really helped um, during the pandemic. What are the technology tools we need for hybrid work? Or what are some things that aren't built yet? Either way, things you have added or things that you're like, wow, I bet we're going to need this. Well, I'll give you 
two. So one is just in, in Slack itself, more and more asynchronous tools. Um, and I would include in that category not just more like audio that you can play later or you, know, you can play back and the creation of transcripts and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but better tools, I need this for triaging all the messages um, and uh, kind of sociological support, I guess, or, or guidance on uh, how to help organizations become more effective in, in this way of communicating. Because um, this is, is something that blows my mind all the time. All right, imagine some of you are executives at companies that have around 10,000 employees. And so like roughly, let's say that's a billion dollars in payroll. If you're an executive, you spend 100%-ish of your time on communication, and you know, more or less every manager is going to be a similar proportion. The person inside the company who spends the least amount of time on, on communication, and I mean reading and writing messages, you know, preparing reports and reading other people's stuff and having phone calls and one-on-one -on -one meetings and all that. Um, the people who spend the least time are, you know, like maybe it's 30, 40, 50%. So if you average it out, you, you have people spending 50 or 60 or 70% of their time on communication. So you're spending $600 million, let's say, a year on communication, and how much investment do you put in to training them to be more effective communicators and have better meetings? The reason that everyone in this room probably knows about the Amazon six-page memo format, and we all read it at the beginning of the meeting before we have the discussion, is because there's so few examples like, of people even trying anything to, to make um, uh, communication better. So I think that, that part is, is something that even at Slack, where we're, I think we're much more conscious of this, we still underinvest. And we do a lot more onboarding. We do have a Slack 102 course and a Slack 102. Yeah, I noticed it was probably one of the most popular things we had at one of our internal meetings was someone just shared their Slack tips. And like one of the things I noticed pre-pandemic that's changed a lot. Pre-pandemic, I didn't feel a huge need to like manage. I didn't even bother to learn like how do I say I'm not available and whatever. Now, like. I would be absolutely, like, I, I just have to set some time aside and mm -hmm. say, I'm in a meeting, I'm taking a break, whatever. Yeah. Um, and it feels like there's even more of a need. Otherwise, the default is kind of you're around 24-7. Mm -hmm. Like, I, there was an article, I think, in the journal about how a lot of workers now have a 9 p.m. shift. Um, I have a yeah. 9 p.m. shift. I have an after the kids go to bed. How many people have a shift that ends you know, starts then or ends after a kid goes to bed or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a lot of people. Like, how, how important is time management and sort of managing, triaging communications in sort of how to use your product well? I think it's very important, and I'm horrible at it. So I'm not sure if I have any, like, great advice or, or feedback. But the other thing that I think we're missing is, um, oh, let me put it this way. I think there's an enormous number of opportunities to make improvements that I almost feel like people haven't made, maybe because they don't think that this is a permanent new normal or, or something like that. Um, but what became really acute for me when my days were 90%-ish Zoom meetings was there's no artifact left behind. Like, we have this meeting, there's all this discussion, we could easily make a transcript, we shared a bunch of documents back and forth. There's not even, like, a record of who was there and how long we talked, which would just be so useful to, to like, bundle that, that stuff up. And I could keep going for a long time, we don't have that much time, um, on, on those kinds of opportunities to make really fundamental uh, product improvements. Two things like Slack, and, and obviously the whole spectrum of, of everything else, but I feel like we're, we have 10% of the tools we need. Um, really quickly, because there isn't enough time to fully get into it, but you know, we thought of ourselves as a global tech industry for a long time. I think the tensions with China started to make us feel like that wasn't the case. You guys had a big wake-up call with Russia. All of a sudden, you had to turn off a ton of users yeah. um, just because of international sanctions and stuff. What did you learn, and what should people take away from that? Is globalization over? Like, are we having to think about regions more? Um, I would have. Uh been much more globalist, internationalist, something like that um, three months ago, I think. So I, I have, uh, I don't know, this, this, the invasion just seems so unbelievable in, in certain respects, like, like a, a, a thing that you would see in a, in a movie. Um, but if that's uh, something that happens, then I think there will be a reconfiguration. Um, and the customers who can't use Slack in Russia will inevitably find something else because they're not, they're not going to shut down. And that will lead to more bifurcation because China is like a totally different world, obviously. 
Well, I had a ton more that I wanted to get to. I actually really was hoping you'd break out the ukulele and uh, play a ditty for us. So next time at Axios, what's next summit to uh, Stuart's going to play the ukulele, which is going to be awesome. Um, thank you so much. Uh, congrats thank on you. the baby. Uh, Stuart Butterfield from Slack. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.